I started learning this, it was just really exciting to see how the Bible, it really is real history, and it does have something to say about this topic. And the Bible's not just any history book, it's the Word of God, of course, which is unique. So, it's helpful for Christians to know something about this topic. And it's, it's, a, uh, it's an exciting topic, it's one that people tend to gravitate toward because most people have an interest in dinosaurs and a lot of the blockbuster movies, the Jurassic Park, the Jurassic World movies, very successful. Uh, because it's a fascinating topic. There are these amazing animals that once lived on this planet, and they're not around anymore, as far as we know. So how do we account for that? How do we make sense of that? Uh, youngsters really like dinosaurs. And so this is a topic that if you want to get your youngster interested in Scripture, this might be a good topic to start with. So let's dive right in. It's always helpful to define our terms. What are dinosaurs? Dinosaurs are, you know, they're reptiles, so they're scaly creatures. But they're different from modern reptiles in a couple of ways. First of all, dinosaurs tended to have large um, holes in their skulls, uh, besides just you know the eye sockets and so on, but they had these large holes in their skulls, perhaps to reduce weight. The main characteristic, however, that makes dinosaurs different from any modern reptile is the structure of their legs. Dinosaurs had their legs underneath their bodies, at least their back legs, underneath their bodies, kind of like the way we're built as opposed to modern reptiles that have their legs out to the side in a sprawling position, if they have legs. We have snakes, of course, they don't have legs, but uh, modern reptiles, modern, uh, anyone that you can think of, their legs are out like this. I think of a crocodile, something like that. And that's a good structure if you want to be able to sprint very quickly over a short distance, if you want to lunge at something. And so uh, modern reptiles have that design. Dinosaurs were designed differently. Their back legs, are, were underneath their body like, like us, and that's better for long distance travel. So do, dinosaurs were perhaps better long distance travelers than their, uh, the modern reptiles that are still around. So they're, my point is they're not, because sometimes people ask, is a dinosaur just like an alligator that got really big over time? No, they're structurally different. They're a different uh, kind entirely. And when we look at dinosaurs, as when we look at any topic, we can look at it from the perspective of secular understanding of things or biblical understanding of things. Those ultimately are your two choices. Uh, I mean, there are other religions, but they are really similar to secular humanism in, in most respects. But in any case, uh, when we, when we, the way most people look at dinosaurs, because they've been trained to think that way, is in terms of millions of years of evolution. And so my secular colleagues, when they come and they look at dinosaur fossils, they already have a view in their mind about what those mean and how they were how they were formed and so on because they believe that life came about gradually over hundreds of millions of years animals evolving from other animals and then in the struggle for life some of them go extinct and new forms evolve and so on and so when they look at dinosaur fossils they have that view in their mind and that affects the conclusions that they draw from those fossils, it really does. And I don't fault them for that. We all have a worldview, but we need to give some thought as to whether that worldview is rational. And I would argue the biblical worldview is. It's the basis for logic. We found that in the first session. So in the biblical worldview, uh, I, when I look at dinosaurs, I look at them from the perspective that the Bible is true. It's the real history of the universe. And so we like to summarize that history with what we call the seven C's. It's just a nice way of remembering biblical history, seven words that start with the letter C. So we have creation, where God created a world that he himself called very good. So it, wasn't, it didn't have the death and suffering that we have in today's world. It was a very good world originally. And then there was corruption. Adam's sin ruined that very good world because God gave, gave Adam a choice to either obey or rebel. And Adam chose to rebel. And the wickedness came into the world as a result of that. And so the world today, it's not very good. We've got some problems in the world today. We've got disease, we have death, and so on. Then there was a catastrophe where the wickedness of mankind became great, and God judged the world by sending his cataclysmic worldwide flood that wiped out all life. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And so he and his family were spared. They were, they were, um, God told him how to build that ark to survive, and along with two of every air-breathing land animal were, that were aboard that ark, and then there was confusion where, again, people rebelled against God. And this time God uh, split them up by confusing the language groups. And we think that's why we have the, the uh, couple of dozen base language groups that we have in the world today. Languages have diversified since then, of course. But that accounts for those different language groups and the different ethnicities that we have in the world, as you have the genetic equivalent of that. 
And then Christ, God himself, steps into history, something that he promised to do back in Genesis. He promised the seed of the woman, meaning one of her descendants, would crush the head of the serpent, meaning destroy Satan's power. And that's what Christ did on the cross, where he took our place, substituted for us. And then in the future, there will be the consummation. And that's where paradise lost will be paradise restored. But we can only be a part of that if we've trusted in Christ and, and if he's paid for our sins on the cross. And there's a sense in which that's already started, because if you're a Christian, if you're in Christ, you are a new creature, you're a new creation. So in a way, that's already started, but we haven't seen the fullness of that uh, yet. So when I look at dinosaurs, that's the view of history that I have in mind. And that happens to be the true history of the universe, as recorded by people who were actually there, and by written, of course, by inspiration of God. So we have two reasons to believe that that's, that's uh, very accurate. So... You want to think rightly about something, you've got to think biblically about it. And so we want to make sure that we do that. Put on your biblical reality glasses so we can see the universe as it really is. And that's going to help us bring things into focus uh, because the Bible is like corrective lenses because it's the correct view of history. So we put those on. We find, for example, that we can conclude about dinosaurs that they were made on day six of the creation week. Now, how do I know that? Well, because all land animals were made on day six, according to scripture, everything that creeps on the earth. And we know dinosaurs are land animals by definition. Land animals, and human beings for that matter, were made on day six of the creation week. Therefore, dinosaurs were made on day six of the creation week. This is a basic form of logic. This is an elementary syllogism, so, and it is valid. So there's no doubt that dinosaurs, according to scripture, would have been made on day six. And uh, what, now, what about um, flying reptiles? Well, technically, those aren't dinosaurs, but we're going to talk about them because they're neat. Uh, they're made on day five. What about swimming reptiles like plesiosaurs? We're going to talk about those too. Technically, those are not dinosaurs. Uh, they were made on day five, okay? So, but the true dinosaurs were land animals and therefore were made on day six, the same day as human beings. That bothers folks, but it's just, it is the clear teaching of Scripture. Dinosaurs are not millions of years old. According to Scripture, nothing is. Uh, they did live alongside human beings, alongside people. And we don't often see that. In you know, children's books that depict the Garden of Eden, you don't often see dinosaurs there, but they would have been familiar with them. And the other thing that bothers people, because they've seen movies like Jurassic Park, where you know, we know dinosaurs, you know, they're dangerous. Well, originally, God, everything God made was very good. So that includes the animals. All the animals originally would have been very good. Now, after sin, all bets are off, but originally, everything's very good. And that includes the dinosaurs. So they would have been peaceful creatures, originally, and uh, Adam and Eve would have known about them. They might not have lived right in the same area, but they would have known about them. There's another way you could know that dinosaur fossils are not hundreds of millions of years old, and that's because, according to Scripture, death came into the world after and as a result of Adam's sin. By man came death, the Bible teaches. And so when you pick up a dinosaur fossil, you shouldn't be thinking, well, this was millions of years before Adam. No, it couldn't have been. It had to have been at some point after Adam sinned, logically. And so, uh, and a good... Uh, event that would kill lots of organisms and bury them quickly, the worldwide flood would make sense of that. So, yeah, so they came in, the, it has to be after, it's some point after Adam sinned, any of these fossils that we find, because a fossil is a dead thing. And death came into the world by Adam's sin, therefore it had to be after Adam sinned. People say, oh, but they can radiometrically date fossils. Actually, they don't. They date, they date rocks that surround the fossils and so on. But people have this misconception that when you dig up a fossil, it comes with a little label telling you how old it is. They don't. Okay, they don't come that way. You might have seen fossils with labels attached to them in museums. They didn't come that way. Those were attached later by someone who was not around when the fossil formed and therefore doesn't know how old it is. And I'm happy to talk about things like radiometric dating and things like that because um, that's physics and it's something that I find very interesting. But the bottom line is you can't tell how old something is just by looking at it, really. Certainly not something like a fossil. Is there evidence that dinosaurs lived recently? Scientific evidence. There is. What if we found something like red blood cells? Would, that, would, would you think that would last hundreds of millions of years? No, because we have found stuff like that. Um, soft tissue has been discovered in uh, a number of dinosaur bones. So and, and that's what you're seeing there. Those are actual images from a T-Rex femur. That's one of the leg bones of a Tyrannosaurus, and that's soft tissue. We found that, um, you know, so most animals, when they die, they're recycled back in the environment, okay? But, uh, most, most things don't become a fossil. You want to form a fossil, you bury it quickly, 
and then the minerals will move in and usually the, the soft tissue usually has time to decay away, but the bone, um, minerals will move into the bone. Bones are porous, they have lots of little holes in them and therefore are very light, whereas a fossil is heavy because minerals have moved into the holes in the bone and mineralized it. And so you get a stone that's in the shape of a bone, that's what a fossil is. But we found that a lot of times if you dissolve away the outer portion of the fossil using acid, there's still soft tissue inside. And that's, that's really neat, including blood vessels. And what you're seeing here are blood vessels, including some with red blood cells still in them from a Tyrannosaurus rex femur. Isn't that neat? And I think it's, it's by divine providence that it was actually an evolutionist who made this discovery. Uh, Dr. Mary Schweitzer, she was very honest about her discovery. And I think that's neat because if we creationists had discovered that, everybody would cry foul, right? I said, no way, you're faking that. There's no, because they can't last that long. But it was an evolutionist who made that discovery and she reported it honestly and I'm glad she did. So she was doing good science there. So there you go, red blood cells in a Tyrannosaurus rex a femur, pretty neat. And of course that's not gonna last hundreds of millions of years. Soft tissue doesn't do that. Uh, did dinosaurs evolve? Well, we know from scripture they didn't. And, and we gotta be clear on our definitions. We don't wanna commit the equivocation fallacy, right? Things do change over time. The modern dogs we have today, the modern breeds are recent, but dogs go back to creation. And likewise, dinosaur, uh, you can get different dinosaur varieties within a kind, but the kinds themselves did not evolve. And frankly, any evolutionist who's honest about that, honest about what we fall, see in the fossil record would admit that. Because this is from, actually from an evolutionist textbook, this is the, the family tree of dinosaurs, the way that evolutionists think that they branched from one kind to another. And this represents how far down we find them in what's called the geologic column, which is a, represent, is a, it's a representation of the orders in which fossils typically come. We find that some fossils are typically found below other types of fossils and so on. And so you, you build this up, it's kind of an abstract concept, but it's useful. And so they, they, the secularists would say, this represents how many millions of years ago these things lived. Whereas we would say, no, it's just, they're buried earlier in the flood as opposed to later in the flood. But in any case, um, you notice the footnote there, it says highlighted areas indicate solid fossil evidence. So the areas that are in light blue are the places where you find, where you actually find the fossils. Where's all the branching, the evolution happening? All the places you don't find fossils. Isn't that interesting? And they're just reporting that very honestly. So we do find evidence of changes within a kind. We don't find evidence of changes between kinds. And that's typical. That's, that's really what we find throughout the fossil record, not just in dinosaurs, but in other creatures as well. There's always gonna be a handful of disputed specimens, which the evolutionists themselves end up rejecting a few years later. But this is the rule. We find uh, variation within a kind, which is what we creationists would expect. So there you go. So they didn't evolve. What do dinosaurs eat? Now there's a subject that we like to think about. Uh, now, you know, because again, we've seen the movies, we know what they eat, because we, we, we've watched Jurassic Park. So there you go. We know they're eating, that T-Rex would have been eating these other animals. Of course, we now know that dinosaurs lived at the same time as people. So is Adam on the menu? Yeah, yikes. Well. Let's consider a Tyrannosaurus rex, for example. He had teeth up to six inches long with a serrated edge. How would the first T-Rex have been described? The first of that kind, how would he have been described? Would he have been a plant eater, a meat eater, a scavenger, or a plant and meat eater? Now, most people, when I ask that question, they say, well, it's a meat eater, right? We know that, because again, we've seen Jurassic Park. We know what T-Rex eats, he eats lawyers, right? We get that. But according to scripture, they would have been plant eaters. That really bugs people because of those teeth. But it, it is what the Bible teaches. Genesis 1, 29 through 30, God speaking to Adam and Eve, and God said, See, I've given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Verse 30, also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, would that include dinosaurs? Are they part of everything? Yeah, everything's part of everything, of course. So I says, I've given every green herb for food, and it was so. Oh, so originally plants are what all dinosaurs would have eaten. Even the ones we today think of as carnivores, they would have originally been vegetarian, as all animals were at the beginning. So that T-Rex is eating plants. We know that from scripture, dinosaurs were originally vegetarian. So he's thinking about eating this kind of stuff. And that does bother folks because of those sharp teeth, right? 
And indeed, T-Rex, there's no doubt, he had six-inch serrated fangs, perfectly designed for ripping and tearing into watermelons and cantaloupes and all kinds of, all kinds of fruits and vegetables. Because if you think about it, there are certain plants that um, require something like a sharp tooth to, to get into them. And we think of a watermelon as soft, and it is once you get to the inside. We take something like a sharp knife, kind of like a sharp tooth, to cut it open, right, to get to the soft stuff on the inside. T-Rex could bite right into one and it wouldn't be a problem for him. Not at all. And by the way, there are animals today that have sharp teeth that are either entirely or primarily vegetarian. This particular primate is primarily vegetarian, only occasionally supplementing his diet with meat, and yet he's got sharp teeth. There are monkeys in Ethiopia. The males have these large fangs. And you think, well, surely those are meat eaters. They're not. They're plant eaters. They're vegetarian. The grass-eating monkeys of Ethiopia. You say, well, what are those long teeth for then? I don't know, but they eat plants. Okay? They eat grass and stuff. So um, here's the skull of a particular creature that you look at the sharp teeth on that thing and you think, well, that thing's got to be a meat eater, right? But he's not, and we know that because this species is still around today. This is the skull of a fruit bat. Fruit bats eat fruit, turns out. Yeah. Now, obviously, at some point after sin, and it would have to be after sin, that some animals, some animals became meat eaters. Why after sin? Because when you eat meat, you're eating... A dead thing, hate to break it to you, that's what meat is, right? And there was no death before Adam sinned, so there would have been no meat to eat before Adam sinned. Okay, so of course they, you can't be a meat eater back then. Now, by the way, if you had a hot dog for lunch, that's okay, because after the flood, God gave human beings permission to eat meat. In Genesis 9, 3, he says, as I gave you the plants, and I'll give you everything that creeps on the earth, which is kind of what a hot dog is. So there you go, Okay. So you're okay. And, and some, at some point, some of the animals started eating meat, because they do today. And we don't know exactly when that happened, but it would have been after sin, obviously. But it's interesting that even today, there are animals that we think of as meat eaters that will go back to their pre-fall vegetarian diet. Did you know that? Like lions, for example. We know lions are meat eaters, right? Well, there was a, a female lion named Little Tyke that went her whole life raised in captivity, and she went her whole life without ever eating meat. Isn't that interesting? There she is with one of her uh, caretakers. It's the way all animals would have been before sin entered the world. They would have been peaceful creatures. Now, they would try to give little tyke meat. You can see them trying to give her meat there because everybody knows that lions need meat to live. Well, she didn't know that. And she, you can see she's turning away from it. She doesn't even like the smell of raw meat. Uh, she would drink milk, however. So she's not vegan. She would at least drink uh, <laughs> milk. Well, she's a mammal. We expect that. That's fine. So isn't that interesting? And uh, it reminds us there are certain passages in Scripture that predicted this. In Isaiah 11:7, the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Isaiah 65:25. Isn't that interesting? The Bible predicted a time when animals that we think of as meat eaters would go back to their pre-fall diet, and we're seeing that now. We're at least the beginnings of it. Well, okay. Why don't we find the word dinosaur in the Bible? Is a question I get a lot because we've learned. So, so far, all the things we've learned are implicit. They would apply to all land animals. All land animals are made on day six. All were vegetarian, and therefore the dinosaurs were too. But why don't we find the word dinosaur in the Bible? And there's a very obvious reason for that. The word dinosaur is a modern word. It was invented in 1841 by Sir Richard Owen. And so when the Bible was translated into English, and there have been a number of early English translations, there was the Wycliffe version in the 1300s, the Geneva Bible, 1560, the King James comes along in 16 or Geneva's 1560, the King James comes along in 1611. No, all those early versions of the Bible are not going to have the word dinosaur in it because the word dinosaur didn't exist. It was invented by Richard Owen in 1841. He was a creationist, by the way. And uh, it means terrible lizard. That's what dinosaur means, terrible lizard. So, of course, you're not going to find the word there. But you will find the word dragon in many English translations of the Bible. And if you think about what a dragon is, it's pretty much how you would, that's the ancient word that would, you would have used to describe anything like a dinosaur. And probably it's generic and would have, used, would have been used to describe other things that are not true dinosaurs, like plesiosaurs, which are aquatic, uh, for example. The Hebrew word that is translated dragon is tanin. And here, is, here are examples of tanin that I've been able to find in the Old Testament of the Bible. Quite a few. Pretty neat. So those are potentially dinosaurs or similar kind of creatures like plesiosaurs, things like that. It's kind of a generic word. Well, what about specific varieties of dinosaur? Would you, do we find those? Well, I believe we do. But keep in mind, they're not going to be called by their modern name. 
right? When we started discovering the bones of these things, we gave them new names, obviously. The, the people that uh, named the creatures that they actually saw would have given them different names. And we find some examples, though, of creatures that have a name that's unfamiliar to us and that fit the description of dinosaurs, like Behemoth, for example, which is mentioned in Job chapter 40, beginning in verse 15. We read about this creature called Behemoth. That's the actual Hebrew word. They left it untranslated because they weren't sure how to translate it. it. It's related to the word for beast, so it might be mean like beast of beasts, something like that. And uh, in any case, when we read the description of it, it sounds an awful lot like a sauropod dinosaur, one of these ones that had the long neck and the long tail and were the largest of the land animals as far as we know. So pretty neat. And it's always good to, to check the context of the section of the Bible that we're reading. Job is often classified, it's classified as wisdom literature, which would include things like the Psalms and Proverbs. Uh, and, and of course, the Psalms and Proverbs are written in a poetic fashion. Much of Job is written poetically as well. But that's because the speeches of Job and his friends were written poetically. Apparently, they had written them out. And in any case, they got recorded. Um, but it's interesting because Job's really a history book. It's just accurately recording historically the speeches that Job and his friends made. And those speeches tend to be poetic in nature. So it's, it's good to understand that context. And we talk about the patience of Job. And he was very patient. He never cursed God to his credit, no matter how bad things got. But he was getting a little impatient at the end. He wanted to have a conversation with God. He wanted to know why what had been happening had been happening to him. And we can hardly blame him for that. And God graciously answered Job beginning in chapter 38. God steps out of heaven and answers Job and basically says, Okay, Job, before we have this conversation, let's see if you're qualified. And he begins asking Job a series of questions that Job can't answer. And Job covers his mouth and says, I spoke without understanding. I can't argue with the Almighty, right? But he got the point. But in this, in this response that God gives, he begins asking Job about the various creatures that he made. And he builds up. And these are real creatures that Job would have been familiar with. That's my point in saying this, is that when we get to, verse, when we get to chapter 40, verse 15, this obviously was a real creature that Job had seen. Otherwise, God's argument would make no sense, right? So this was something that Job was familiar with, and God is comparing his power and really showing that his power is superior, obviously, to anything that he'd made. Basically, the argument is, Job, you can't even deal with my creatures. What makes you think you can argue with me? That's basically the argument. So let's take a look at it and see if it fits the description of one of these long-necked dinosaurs. Uh, verse 15, look now at Behemoth, which I made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. So he's an herbivore, even at this point in history, apparently they, we think the long-necked dinosaurs remained herbivores. Uh, verse 16, see now his strength is in his hips and his power is in his stomach muscles. That would be a good description of these long-necked dinosaurs. They had very strong muscles along their belly, which they needed to support their long neck and their long tail. Verse 17, he moves his tail like a cedar. That would be a tree. So when he moves his tail, it's like moving a tree. Pretty impressive, and that would fit the description of one of these long-necked, long-tailed dinosaurs. Uh, verse 18, his bones are like beams of bronze, his ribs like bars of iron. So it's describing how, how essentially indestructible this creature is. Verse 19, he, he is the first of the ways of God, perhaps indicating that he's the most impressive or largest thing that God made. And we do think that the long-necked dinosaurs were the largest land animal that God created. The largest animal that God created is still around. It's the blue whale. So, but the largest land animal, we think, were these, these types of dinosaurs. It says, only he who made him can bring near his sword. That sounds awkward in English, but it's basically saying only God could attack this animal. If you come at it with a sword, it's just going to bat you away with its tail, and that's the end of you. Okay, so it's an impressive creature, whatever it is, and it does seem to fit the description of one of these long-necked, long-tailed uh, sauropodomorph-type dinosaurs, because those tails would be like a cedar tree when they moved. It would be massive, like a tree trunk. Now, some people, well, actually some Bibles even, in the footnotes, they'll have behemoth, and they'll have a footnote, possibly an elephant or hippopotamus. Now, the thing you need to remember about your footnotes, the footnotes in your Bible, they're not inspired. Okay, it's the text that's inspired. The footnotes can be wrong. Um, could this be an elephant or hippo? Well, does an elephant have a tail like a cedar tree? No, it does not. It has a tail like a little rope. Does a hippopotamus have a tail like a cedar tree? No, it does not. It has a tail like a little flap. Okay. 
So when I'm doing this one for uh, the youngsters, I like to say, you could imagine an elephant or a hippo with a tail like a cedar tree. That's not going to work out <laughs> so well. So yeah, that's rather silly. So I don't, I don't know for sure that behemoth is a, a sauropod dinosaur. I just know it doesn't fit the description of an elephant. It's not an elephant or hippo because they don't have a tail that moves like a cedar tree. So, but it could very well be a sauropod dinosaur. In the next chapter of Job, we read about a swimming creature. So I don't think this is a true dinosaur, but I do think it's something like a plesiosaur, one of these swimming creatures that had the four uh, flippers and lived in the, in the lakes and oceans, perhaps. Yeah, but air breathing, so they are reptiles. And we read the description of it. It's impressive. Verse 1, can you draw a leviathan with a hook or snare his tongue with a line which you lower? That's a rhetorical question. God's saying, can you fish this thing out like you would catfish? Of course not, right? Verse 9, indeed, any hope of overcoming him is false. Shall one not be overwhelmed at the sight of him? Verse 10, no one is so fierce that would dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand against me? You see the argument God's making? You can't even deal with my creature. What makes you think you can stand up against me? Verse 15, as rows of scales are his pride. So it's a scaly creature. It is a reptile. One is so near another that no air can come between them. Verse 22 says, strength dwells in his neck and sorrow dances before him. So that made me think of one of these long-necked plesiosaurs, like an elasmosaurus, perhaps. There's different varieties, different uh, breeds or species even. So could have been one of those. When he raises himself up, the mighty are afraid. Because of his crashings, they're beside themselves. When he raises himself up, apparently this thing could come near the shore and raise itself up, and it was terrifying to uh, human beings because it was a mighty creature, whatever it was. On earth there is nothing like him which is made without fear. Isn't that interesting? And there are other passages too, I didn't read all of them, you might read them later, uh, that talk about sparks leaping out of its mouth and smoke going out of its nostrils. And people, here's where people really get incredulous. They'll say, no way, not, it's not only is it a dragon, it's a fire-breathing dragon. And they say, you can't have that. And then my follow-up question is, why not? Right? Because there are some amazing animals that the Lord made that have, that have some amazing abilities. There's a bombardier beetle that mixes a couple of chemicals with a catalyst in its abdomen. It's able to produce a hot spray protect, to protect it from predators. There's no reason why God couldn't do that with a larger animal. right? So the chemistry is there. You just need something to ignite it and to protect him from his own flame. There's, it's, there's nothing uh, insane about that chemistry. There are all kinds of amazing animals. And if we just found their bones, if we just found the bones of an electric eel... I mean, we wouldn't know that it could produce voltage, right? You can't tell that from just fossils. So we've got to be careful about just assuming that, well, that can't be possible. That's not a logical objection. Apparently, this thing could produce something like a flame, something that resembled a flame for whatever reason. What about flying reptiles? They are mentioned in the Bible. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 29, talks about a fiery flying serpent. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 6, fiery flying serpent. Isn't that fascinating? And uh, it's pretty neat there. The flying, the, these flying serpents, uh, they, there's a special term in Hebrew, seraph. It's related to seraphim, which is a class of uh, angels. But uh, there were physical creatures that, that were reptiles. They're, they're serpents, but they're flying serpents. And the word for fiery there can either mean um, vividly colorful or it can mean, it, it's related to the word for burning. And so it can either refer to a vivid color like a flame in a fire or, or perhaps it means they're poisonous, the burning sensation that you get when they bite you. We're not sure, but it's interesting. And there are a few other places too where seraph are mentioned in the singular as physical creatures and not, not the class of angels. So uh, including, there's one account where the uh, Israelites are in the wilderness and there's that plague of serpents, right? Now in some cases it's nekesh, which is the normal word for serpent. It'd be like a snake. In other cases, they use uh, seraph. So it might have been a combination of terrestrial snakes and flying reptiles that they were dealing with at that time. It's a possibility anyway. And it's fun to think about. In any case, the flying serpents are mentioned. Serpent's just the ancient word for reptile. So the Bible does mention flying reptiles. People saw them. Then the question that people ask was, well, were dinosaurs on Noah's Ark? And would they fit? Right? Because this is where, again, people, the critics especially, will get incredulous. Well, first of all, would they have been on Noah's Ark? What does the Bible say? Genesis 7, 8 through 9, of animals, of clean animals and animals that are not clean, and birds and everything that creeps on the ground. That would include dinosaurs, wouldn't it? There went into the Ark to Noah by twos, male and female, as God had commanded. So, yeah, they would have been on the Ark. 
they would have been on the ark. And this is where the critics mock and say, there's no way you could possibly get dinosaurs on board Noah's ark, because dinosaurs were huge, right? So you can't possibly fit them on Noah's ark. Now, it seems to me that when a critic makes that objection, we have to ask two questions. Do you know how big Noah's ark was? And do you know how many animals would have to go on board? Two of each kind, but how, how many is that? Is it a million? A billion? A thousand? And the funny thing is, most critics don't know how big Noah's Ark was, although the Bible does give you the dimensions. And then most critics don't know how many animals would have to go on board. But they're just convinced that you can't possibly get all those animals on board Noah's Ark. But my point is, that's not a logical objection, isn't it? Is it? That you can't possibly fit an unknown number of animals on a boat of unknown size. That's not a logical objection. Uh, we need to go through and do our math. So how big was Noah's Ark? Well, 300 cubits by uh, 50 by 30. We, a cubit's the distance from your elbow to the end of your hand. Now, that's a little different for different people, isn't it? And so there's, there's a little bit of leeway there. But this would be the smallest possible cubit. Uh, this would be a 17 and a half inch cubit. We think 18 inches would be more, more realistic. A foot and a half is a cubit, basically. So Noah's Ark would have been realistically 450 feet by 75 by 45. Could have been a little bigger than that. Uh, depending on what you assume for the cubit. But that's the approximate size of Noah's Ark. See, people have misconceptions of Noah's Ark. And I'm sorry to say that some of that's promoted even in Christian children literature, where it's depicted as this little bathtub thing with all the animals jam-packed on board, and they're all happy and smiling, even though the world's being destroyed. I never did quite get that. But that's not the real Ark. The Ark that the Bible describes was massive. It had the same capacity as 522 railroad stock cars. And, you know, of course... Um, the ministry Answers in Genesis, run by Ken Ham, they built a replica of it, and it's something to see. When you're there, you realize that thing was massive. And uh, it, it was. 522 railroad stock cars. You ever counted the cars as they go by the tracks? I've never counted 522. That's pretty impressive. So, you could imagine Noah's shock and disappointment if God told him to build a little bathtub ark, but no, God told him to build an ark that would survive a worldwide flood. Uh, little bathtub arks would not survive a worldwide flood. They tip over very easily. The ark that God designed is designed to weather a worldwide flood. We've had engineers that have studied it, like Tim Lovett, for example. He did this wonderful study on the ark, and he found if you change the dimensions, any, from what the Bible describes, it makes it worse. The, the, the ark that is depicted in the Bible, the dimensions are ideal for weathering a worldwide flood in terms of stability, comfort of ride, in a, you know, not wanting to capsize, and so other, and, and, and things of that nature. So... So Noah's Ark, huge, much bigger than people think it was. It was big, but was it big enough? How many animals would have to go on board? And this is where people get a little bit confused because they think, well, you know, you need two of each kind, but a lot of people don't know what a kind is, and they assume that it's either a species or a breed or something like that. But no, you, Noah did not need to take two Dalmatians, two deer hounds, two beagles, two kelpies, two collies. He certainly didn't need two poodles on board the Ark, right? He just needed two... Dogs, yeah, two dogs, and you can get all those breeds later. These breeds are recent, like golden retrievers. I love golden retrievers, but they weren't around 200 years ago. It's a modern breed, and we understand genetically how that works. Uh, natural processes along with created heterozygosity, where you have um, differences in the genes from the two parents. I, I won't go into details, but that's how you get these different varieties. Now, there's still dogs, but my point is you just needed two dogs on Noah's Ark. You need two cats on Noah's Ark, two. So that, uh, that big African lion and the little thing that you pet when you come home, they were both descended from two cats that were on Noah's Ark. Okay? Believe it or not. Their cats have diversified since creation and since uh, the flood even. And a colleague of mine, Dr. Nathaniel Jeanson, who's PhD in biology from Harvard, he studies these issues and he's done some fascinating work on genetics and how we get speciation after the flood. They're still the same kinds, but you can get new species. It's not a problem. And my point is, it's the same with the dinosaurs. There are thousands of dinosaurs, but a lot of them belong in the same kind, the ceratopsian kind. So Noah didn't need two triceratops, two eoceratops, two torosaurus, two monoclonius, two pachyrhinoceros. He just needed two of the ceratopsian kind, and you can get all those breeds later. It's not a problem. And so although there are thousands of dinosaur names, we think there are only about 60 dinosaur kinds. Okay, so that's the... The, the basic family that they fall into. And so if there are 60 dinosaur kinds, two of each kind, because dinosaurs would have been part of the unclean varieties, 
So that means there would have been 120 dinosaurs on Noah's Ark. Not thousands, 120. And we can add those up along with the other animals. John, these are John Wood Merapi's numbers. He did a study a while back. So over the 7,000 mammals, 4,600 birds, reptiles, including the dinosaurs, 3,700 and some. And it's an approximate figure because we're, we're trying to include for extinct species and it's hard to know that there, you know, there might be some we haven't discovered. But there would have been around 16,000 animals on board Noah's Ark. And Wood Merapi's numbers are um, conservative toward the, toward the critic in that they're kind of an upper limit. The true number would probably be a little less than this. Okay. The other thing to remember, because people think, yeah, but 120 dinosaurs, dinosaurs are big. Some dinosaurs are big. Some dinosaurs never got bigger than a dog. Some never got bigger than a chicken, like little Compsognathus. It, was never, it never got bigger than chicken. But it's a dinosaur because it's a reptile and the legs are underneath its body. And that makes it different from modern reptiles, you see. And so, you take a look at this uh, dinosaur skull. Not all of them were huge, folks. Some of them were huge. The other thing to remember is even the largest dinosaurs that existed on this planet started out very small. Right? The largest dinosaur eggs we find are just a little bigger than a football. And it turns out you can't make an egg bigger than that for physics reasons. Because you'd have to make it, in order to support its own weight, you'd have to make the shell thicker. And if you make the shell too thick, you can't get oxygen in. And so that's a problem. So, yeah, so there's a maximum size for an egg. So that big sauropod dinosaur that fills a room in a museum from wall to wall hatched out of an egg that about that big. He wasn't that big when he was first hatched. So wouldn't it make sense then for God to take some of the younger dinosaurs on board Noah's Ark? And by the way, God's the one that brought the animals to Noah. Noah didn't have to go out and hunt them down, right? God said, two of each will come to you. So Noah just had to escort them on board, apparently. But in any case, uh, wouldn't it make sense for God to select some of the younger dinosaurs that maybe had not reached their full size yet? Yeah, that would make sense. I mean, the, the only purpose of bringing the animals on board was to preserve their kinds so they could go out and multiply after the flood, right? So um, why would God take senior citizen dinosaurs? Why wouldn't he take young adults? It would make more sense. Or they could go and reproduce quickly. Maybe not eggs, but, but young, young adults. So we can calculate the amount of space available, 100,000 square feet. We can estimate the amount of space taken up by each of the groups of animals. Birds take up very little space because most of them are very small. Mammals take up the most space because there's the most of them. And not all animals would be on, not all mammals would be on Noah's Ark. Because whales are mammals, they would not have been on the Ark, right? Because they're oceanic creatures. It's only land animals. So yeah, dolphins, things like that would not be on the Ark. So reptiles, those that, are, that, can, that cannot survive off the ark, they would have been a part, of those, uh, part of the reptiles number there. 15% uh, for a grand total, 46.8%. So when we do the math, there was plenty of space on board the ark. And I've seen other estimates too that get it down to 30% even. So, you, I mean, that's pretty neat because you could fit all the animals on one deck because there were three decks to the ark. And if, it, if they take 30% 30, 30 of the space, you could put them all on one deck. That would leave a deck for Noah's sons to play football, and it would leave a deck for Noah and Mrs. Noah to play shuffleboard. So there was plenty of room there. But uh, in, in any case, in the question, why so big? Well, it, they had to take supplies with them. They had to take food and things like that. Anything they wanted to bring with them, they couldn't go back. That pre-flood world was destroyed. I think there was room for more people as well. The Bible says Noah was a preacher of righteousness. So he was out there preaching, hey, God's, God's wrath is going to come, but you can be saved. Come on board the ark and be saved. And people mocked him until the flood came and they drowned. So I think there was room for more people. Now God knew how many people would go on the ark, but Noah probably didn't. And so it might have been big enough to accommodate more people. In any case, there's plenty of room. And, and by the way, this is something too, because we, we do have some youngsters here today, and that's great. Because sometimes youngsters will ask, you know, in their math class, when am I ever going to use this stuff? Well, here you go. Right? I can refute the critics here because I've, done, I've run the numbers. And they haven't. So they're making a claim in ignorance and I'm responding with knowledge. And you can do that if you know math. And any other subject that, that, uh, that we're to study. So, dinosaurs would have been on the ark. They would have got off the ark. So granted, the flood wiped out almost everything, but there were representative kinds on board the ark, which means dinosaurs would have existed even after the flood. 
to some extent. The book of Job was written after the flood by about 400 years. And that's where we find about, you know, behemoth and Leviathan. So anyway, um, but, they're, but keep in mind, they're not going to be called dinosaurs. We, we might find legends of creatures resembling dinosaurs, but they won't be called that because that's a modern word. They'll be called dragons. Do we find legends of people encountering dragons? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. All over the world. And if you think about a, what a dragon is, that's kind of what we would use to describe. That's what the ancients would have used to describe any dinosaur they would have encountered. They would have called it a dragon. There's the legend of St. George and the dragon. There was a town that was being victim, victimized by a dragon that was coming in and eating their livestock. And the legend says that the people were sp going to sacrifice a young lady to this creature, hoping that it would leave them alone. But St. George rides in on his horse and kills the dragon and preaches Christianity. Many people convert. That's a very popular uh, story. And we have found fossils of certain dinosaurs in the region where this story was to have taken place. So including, I believe, Allosaurus fossils. So that's the legend of St. George and the dragon. Now, it's not in the Bible, so we don't know it for sure, but it could have happened just like that, just like the legend says. Marco Polo in AD 1271 reported that the Chinese royal chariots were occasionally pulled by dragons. Isn't that interesting? And, oh, there are lots of legends of dragons in China. You'll find it all over China. It's on their pottery and everything. It's just amazing. And uh, apparently if the, the, these dragons were relatively rare at the time, and so it was the thing to do if you were wealthy or royalty was to have your own and raise your own uh, dragons. Pretty neat. We know from records that in the year 1611, the Chinese emperor appointed the position of royal dragon feeder. There was a job where your job was to feed the dragons, which makes me think they probably had some. So, yeah. There's a city in France that was renamed in the honor of the killing of a dragon there. The animal's described as being larger than an ox, armored, and had horns on its head. Interesting. There was a, there's a town in Italy where a, a peasant was walking with his uh, oxen. They were pulling a cart. He was kind of walking behind them. And they stopped because there was this little hissing dragon on the road up ahead of them. This is not one of the larger ones. This is a small one. But it's very brave. And it was hissing at them, and the oxen were afraid of it. And the man had a staff with him, and he ended up killing this creature, striking it and killing it. And then he brought the body in to a local scientist named Ulysses Aldervandus. That's why we have such good records of this. We know, when it, ha we know it happened on May 13th, 1572, around 5 o'clock p.m. Uh, because the scientist documented the details of this. And he described it so accurately, we think we know what species it is. We think it's a Tanistrophius. And that's something that evolutionists believe have been extinct for millions and millions of years, except people apparently saw them. What about flying reptiles? We have lots of records of those as well. And they appear to be uh, Ramphorhynchus. Ramphorhynchus is a genus of a flying reptile that had, it, they were relatively small, but they had a very long tail. Um, there, are other reptile, there are other flying reptiles like pterodactyloids that had huge wingspans, but they had a very small tail. So we think these are Ramphorhynchus. And the detailed reports of these eyewitness reports go back 400 BC up until about 1600 AD, and then they stop. Uh, Herodotus, one of the Greek historians who confirmed some of the events of scripture, he said there's a place in Arabia, he said, where I went to learn about the winged serpents. He had heard that there were these flying reptiles, he wanted to see them. And so when he arrived there, he found a valley full of dead, apparently Ramphorhynchus, flying reptiles. Uh, pretty, he says, he, he, um, when I arrived there, I saw innumerable bones and backbones of serpents, many heaps of backbones, great and small and even smaller. Winged serpents, that would be the ancient way of saying flying reptile. Winged serpents are said to fly from Arabia at the beginning of spring, making for Egypt, but the ibis birds encounter the invaders in this pass and kill them. Isn't that fascinating? He says, the serpents are like water snakes. Their wings are not feathered, but very like the wings of a bat. He's going out of his way to say, this isn't a bird. This isn't something that has feathers. The, wing, the wings are like a membrane type material like a bat would have. And so it's a flying reptile. And again, the reports go up to about 1600 and then they stop. So we think we know when this went extinct. And it wasn't millions of years ago. It was about 400 years ago, which I think is fascinating. Uh, there are certain ancient coins that will depict what appears to be a serpent with wings on them. So people drew these as well. Now, you might know that sometimes in the past, some people lived in caves. And sometimes people ask me, do you believe in cavemen? Do I believe that men lived in caves? Yes. Some do today, right? So, yeah. 
In fact, if you read uh, the account in Genesis, um, Lot, Abraham's nephew, lived in a cave for a while. So he was a caveman for a little while. And people would paint on the cave walls. I always thought it was the kids that did that, but I don't really know. Uh, in any case, they would paint things like buffalo and people, and occasionally they'd paint things that look an awful lot like dinosaurs. Now, this is before any dinosaur fossils had been found. Dinosaur fossils were found in the 1800s. So apparently the people that were drawing these, which is much earlier, had seen the living creatures. There are ones that look an awful lot like sauropod dinosaurs, the ones with the long neck, the long tail. Now, we've, out, we've enhanced the outline on the PowerPoint on the right. To, otherwise, it doesn't show up well in PowerPoint. But once you see it on the right, you can see it on the left, too. And then there's another one. This was from Natural Bridges National Monument, Utah. People have visited, said it's just obvious when you're there, but it's kind of hard to photograph. But it's a, the long neck, the long tail, the four legs. There are sculptures in France that are uh, large reptiles of some sort, could, be, could well be dinosaurs. They call them salamanders, but you can tell they're reptiles, there's scales on them. And here's one that's fire breathing. And they do match uh, known types of dinosaurs fairly well. Uh, Vance Nelson has a wonderful book that covers a lot of this material. There's ancient tapestries that people have uh, weaved and they depict animals that look an awful lot like certain kinds of known varieties of dinosaur. Pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, this particular sculpture, this is from China. It's thought to be about 4,000 years old. So this would go back to the time of Abraham and, and Job, for that matter. And it looks an awful lot like one of the ceratopsian type dinosaurs, like a centrosaurus. It's really quite astonishing. There's another one, also thought to be about 4,000 years old, also from China. And it resembles a protoceratops. They were a ceratopsian, but they didn't have horns. They just had the, the plate there. Uh, Bishop Bell's tomb. This is in Carlisle Cathedral. And we know when the guy died, he died in 1496. And that's when this tomb was put in place. And so this was before any dinosaur fossils had been found. They, weren't, they wouldn't be found for another several hundred years. And you'll notice that along the sides of that and the top, there are these brass strips. You see those there? There's one along the bottom too, but it's been worn off with time because there's a carpet that goes over this and people walk along the carpet, apparently along the bottom section there. And so there, it's, it, the bottom one's worn off. But the other three have carvings of animals in them. And you can see some of those there. And they're, you know, obvious animals, bats, dogs, fish, birds, and these guys. Isn't that interesting? And we can zoom in on them a little bit for you there. Isn't that fascinating? Long neck, long tail. There's, there's nothing like that around today. There's a temple in Cambodia. I think this goes back to the year 800, if I'm not mistaken. And it has carvings of human beings and various animals, including this one, which is interesting because it looks like one of the uh, stegosaur-type uh, creatures, which I think is very fascinating. So, pretty neat. So, these, you know, we're talking hundreds of years ago, not even thousands in many cases, let alone millions. The Australian Aborigines have a painting of a creature they believe still lives in, uh, in Lake Galilee in northern Queensland of Australia there. And they call it Yaru. That's their name for it. That's their painting of it. And apparently it, that one had died, and they've opened up the digestive tract there. So pretty neat. And it, you can see it's got flippers and the long neck, the long tail. Looks like a plesiosaur. But they call it Yaru. And they think it's still alive, which is interesting. Or at least that kind, that variety. The, the natives in the African Congo have a creature that they claim to have seen as recent as 1990 that resembles a sauropod dinosaur. They call it Mokelium bembi. That's their name for it. And if you show them a picture of a sauropod dinosaur, they'll say Mokelium bembi. If you show them a picture of a bear, they'll go, because they they've never seen one of those. But this creature is said to uh, kill elephants. So whatever it is, it's massive. And you say, why would it kill elephants? Aren't they herbivores? Yeah, but they might be, they might have been territorial. I mean, we don't know. You can't tell how a creature behaves by looking at its bones. You really can't. In any case, um, we don't have, you know, we don't have an actual example. We don't have a photograph of it. So take it with a grain of salt. But I do think it's interesting that eyewitness reports are as recent as 1990, and then they stop. So it might be dead now, but it might have lived a few decades ago. And I do feel a little weird knowing that my life may have overlapped with a dinosaur. It makes me feel a little bit old. 
to be honest with you. Could some dinosaurs still be alive today? Well, we don't know. But there are things as seemingly impossible from an evolutionary perspective, like the Willamai pine. This was a pine tree that was discovered in a particular area of Australia in 1994. And it is, in fact, a living example of fossils of this tree are found in the same layers as dinosaurs and not above. And so secular scientists had assumed that Wallamai pines have been extinct for millions and millions of years since the dinosaurs, in their view. And yet, they're still alive today. And they've now found three locations in Australia where there are growing Wallamai pines. They said it's like finding a living dinosaur. Some of them call it the dinosaur tree because it's found in the same fossils that they are, but it's still around. I think that's interesting. I mean, it's not like a tree can run away and hide, and yet it evaded our detection until 1994. I think that's fascinating. So it makes you wonder if there's some creatures out there we haven't discovered yet. And I'm sure there are creatures we haven't discovered yet, because we discover new ones every year. Um, but it could, it could be that there's ones that we have fossils of that are still around, or not. We don't know. In any case, we don't seem to have dinosaurs today, and people ask what happened to them. What happened to the dinosaurs? Well, they died. They died. Well, why did they die? Well, not, everything dies eventually. It's just a question of whether or not it's able to reproduce before that happens. And there are lots of reasons why animals have gone extinct. And it's not just the dinosaurs. There are lots of species on this planet that lived once and today do not. They're extinct now. Uh, trilobites used to fill Earth's oceans. And they're gone today. They're not around anymore. And we used to have woolly mammoths, and they're not around anymore. And there are all kinds of things like that. Dinosaurs are just the ones that people fasc are fascinated with, because some of them got very big, and that's very impressive. But there are lots of reasons why things go extinct. Disease can come through and wipe them out, or a famine can come through and wipe them out. And, and maybe other animals are able to adjust and, and adapt to other vegetation. But if you're not able to do that, you go extinct. Some of them are hunted to extinction. You read all these legends of heroes going out and slaying dragons. Maybe we cause their extinction that way. That's certainly a possibility. But ultimately, the reason things go extinct is because sin entered the world. When Adam sinned, that brought death on everything in creation. And it bothers folks. Why do animals have to suffer when Adam sinned? Because Adam was given charge over the animals. That's the nature of authority. That's the way it works. Just like when our government does something stupid, we all suffer as a result of it because we're under their authority, whether you like it or not. So the animals were under Adam's authority when he sinned. Death entered the world, and it passed on to not just to human beings, but to the animals as well. God instituted animal death at that time because he sacrificed an animal to provide skins of clothing for Adam and Eve. So the ultimate reason we don't have dinosaurs anymore is because of sin. That's the ultimate reason. That's the the distal cause as opposed to the proximate cause. So it's, and that segues to the gospel because when, by the way, we think most of these dinosaur fossils that we find were formed during that worldwide flood. You might have a few afterwards, but we think most of them were during that worldwide flood because that's gonna kill lots of organisms, bury them in sediment and calcite crystals will move through and cause it to turn to rock and so on. So um, it's a reminder that God judges sin He's done it before, and he's going to do it again. Now, next time, he's not going to do it by water. He's promised never to flood the world again by water, the entire world. We have local floods, but never, we've, never, we've only had the one global flood, and we only will ever have the one global flood. But the next time, he's going to judge it by fire, and the only way you can escape that is by repenting and trusting in Christ. And so you can actually use dinosaurs as a segue to the gospel, and I can't think of a better use of dinosaurs than as a segue to the gospel. They're missionary lizards. They remind us that, uh, yeah, they are. They remind us that God judges sin. And if, if Adam hadn't sinned, we'd still have dinosaurs today. They'd still be peaceful today. They'd be peaceful creatures, as all would be. And uh, it would have been a very different world. But we'll get to experience that world in the resurrection. Maybe God will resurrect the dinosaurs too. That'd be kind of neat. In any case, you can sum up dinosaur history with the five Fs. Dinosaurs were formed on day six of the creation week. Created uh, as originally as plant eaters, originally. Then they've fallen when Adam did because sin entered the world and death came in as a result of sin. And so dinosaurs, uh, maybe some of them became meat eating at that point. 
We do think some of them became meat eaters over the course of time. Then there was the flood, where that would have buried lots of organisms, including the dinosaurs. But there were representative kinds on the ark. And so they got off the ark and reproduced. And then they faded. For whatever reason, the dinosaurs didn't seem to reach the same population size after the flood that they had before the flood. And so eventually they're passed down by word of mouth. Maybe some of the stories are combined or distorted a little bit into our modern conception of a dragon, which sometimes some of our modern dragons combine different varieties of dinosaurs and flying reptiles and things like that. So, and then do finally dinosaurs were found. They were rediscovered in the 1800s when we started fo finding fossils of these amazing creatures and realized there were some amazing animals on this planet at one point. And, you know, the, the secular world likes to use dinosaurs to teach people about evolution. And they start young, very young. There are, I've seen dinosaur, progr dinosaur programs for children where they're already teaching evolution. And they think that if they put that story in, and because it involves these amazing creatures, that people will, will buy the story. And it's clever. We need to recognize that Christians are not the only fishers of men. But we can use the truth about dinosaurs to show people, no, God's word is true from the beginning. It makes sense of the evidence that we have. It really does. And that's what we're all about at the Biblical Science Institute. We want to connect the Bible to the real world and show you that the Bible is not just a collection of fairy tales. It's real history. It happened. I mean, every day, it seems like we have new archaeological discoveries that confirm some event that's recorded in the Bible. And we've seen that the fossil evidence confirms what the Bible records as well. So that basically is a summary of dinosaurs from a biblical perspective. I hope that's been a blessing to you. We do have this presentation available on DVD, Dinosaurs in the Bible. And then let, let me again remind you about uh, some of our other resources as well. The Ultimate Proof of Creation, this is my best-selling book, and it's going to give you a bulletproof argument for biblical creation. It's going to show you that unless creation is true, you couldn't really prove that anything is true because all the methods of science, logic, all of that is predicated on God upholding his universe in a consistent way that we can probe and do. That's why the scientific method works. So that's, a, that's very powerful when you realize that. And that's why, of course, the founding fathers of the various disciplines of science, or almost, almost all of them were Christians. They expected to find order in the universe because God's a God of order and has imposed order on his creation. Uh, taking back astronomy refutes the Big Bang in the billions of years. And this is, of course, my area of expertise is astronomy, astrophysics. And uh, there's a lot of pictures in that book. Some people have assumed that it's a children's book because it's got lots of pictures in it. It's not. It's for adults. I just think adults like pictures, too. So there you go. And it's, it's one of the ways the universe declares God's glory is it's very beautiful. And then Stargazer's Guide to the Night Sky, How to Enjoy the Night Sky, and the Day Sky, for that matter. There's daytime astronomy in there as well. If you want to know when the next uh, eclipse is happening, the next solar eclipse next year. Very, very exciting. So that's pretty neat. Um, and then, again, the DVDs as well. I won't go through all those. Don't, remember, don't forget about the, um, the, um, the packs, the book pack, the, the DVD pack, or the library pack. Library pack's 30% discounted. You get kind of the best of everything. And then our children's resources as well, including some on dinosaurs. We do have some on dinosaurs back there that you might want to check out. So a lot of good stuff there. And don't forget to sign up for a free monthly newsletter and check us out on the web, biblicalscienceinstitute.com. And we're going to take, I think, a 15-minute or so break. And so go buy some books. And if you want to come back, we'll do a Q&A session as our final session. So thank you very much. God bless.
problem of induction. And this may go with it. I'll go ahead and ask this too. What are the best resources that respond to the problem? Yeah, so uh, Hume is asking the question, uh, basically, how do we know that the sun will rise tomorrow? Or for that matter, uh, whenever we use past experience as a basis for predicting future success, we're assuming induction. We're assuming that there's an underlying uniformity between future and past. That's why we can do that. And, and, and a, a Christian can justify induction by uh, appealing to Scripture because we have a promise from God. God has promised that he will uphold the future like the past, right? In Genesis 8.22, God promises the basic cycles, the seasons, the day and night cycle. He says they will continue as long as the earth remains. So until judgment day, there's a certain predictability in the universe, okay? And we can rely on that, and that's how science assumes that. Science assumes induction. Hume found that uh, on his secular worldview, he could not account for induction. He, he knew that the sun would rise tomorrow, but he didn't know how he knew that the sun would rise tomorrow. Okay? And it won't do to say, well, it rose yesterday, because that begs the question, right? To say, well, therefore it will tomorrow. But how do you know that? If the, how do you know that the future will be like the past in terms of basic cycles? Now, obviously, we can't predict specific events, um, but we can predict, like, today's eclipse. I knew it was coming cause we, because I'm relying on the orderliness that God has instilled in nature. And God's in a position to know that because he's beyond time. And so he can tell us what the future will be, and he has a perfect track record on that. The prophecies given in Scripture and so on. We'd expect that. Um, but Hume couldn't. And it bothered him to the point that he wanted to give up philosophy and play games with his friends. And he wrote about that in his, one of his books. He said that it just frustrated him to that point. So that's Hume's problem of induction, is that you cannot account for it apart from the Christian worldview. Everyone assumes it, but only the Christian has a logical basis for that assumption, and therefore only the Christian is rational, right? Because we're, it's, it's irrational to act on something for which you have no good reasons. And Hume couldn't find any good reasons to believe in induction, even though he did believe in it. So, and the, the resources, anything by Bonson, Bonson's written on that topic, Greg Bonson, B-A-H-N-S-E-N. -E he was an expert on Kant and Hume and all those guys. He himself had a PhD in philosophy, and very brilliant and, and devout Christian. And uh, he wrote on that subject. I learned about it from Bonson, so he's going to know more about it than I do. All right. How do, you, how do we demonstrate the futility of pragmatism? A lot of unbelievers will say they know they can rely on laws of logic because they work. How do we show the absurdity of that position? Well, I could ask, how do you know they work? Um, and then, you know, you're, as well, my sensory experience. Well, there you're assuming something, aren't you? You're assuming sensory experience. Or they've worked in the past. Okay, but that doesn't justify you having confidence that they will work in the future unless you know about induction, which you can't justify apart from the Christian worldview. So, but pragmat pragmatism, just because something works, doesn't mean it'll work tomorrow unless you know something about induction, right? And uh, it doesn't mean it's true. The Ptolemaic solar system kind of works. It allows you to make successful predictions, not perfectly, but, but it's not true. The old Ptolemaic model was geocentric and had the planets doing little loops as they do went around the big loop. There was no mechanism for why, that, why they did that. Today we know it's because, well, it's the Earth orbiting the sun that's causing those little, those little epicycles. But, um, but it did kind of work. It allowed astronomers to make successful predictions, not at the precision we have today. But just because something works or sort of works doesn't make it true. All right, a couple of maybe easy ones here for you. How many books have you written? Actually, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> the answer, uh, at least 10. all these I don't know. Of course, astrophysic questions, yeah. answers and answers, and how many books? You're like, I don't know that. Hey, it's me. It's like, what's your favorite color? Oh, you okay. got me. I don't know. More than um, one. More than 10, at least. And uh, there's, see, there's some that I'm a co author on, too, so I don't right. know if that counts. But in any case, oh, quite a lot. Uh, all right, here's a very difficult one. How old are you? 48. 48 years old. No. Yeah, Google's right. Yeah, not 73. According to, according to Google, I'm 73. Oh, that's interesting. All right, what are all the names of the planets and stars and moons and galaxies? I don't, you got okay, that? Okay, here we go. Okay, go. Um, the planets in our solar system, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Pluto got demoted and he got Pluto, but um, he's still there. And there are some asteroids. That, there's, by the way, it's not the first time that happened. Pluto uh, was not the first, but I think there's another question on that, so I'll save that for later. Um, the moons, they're, they're, the moon, like uh, Earth's moon is moon, 
Mars is Phobos and Deimos, Jupiter, the big four, Io, Europa, Ganymede, Callisto. Um, when, I was, when I was a kid, I knew all the moons. And I still all know all the moons I knew when I was a kid, but they've now discovered over 100 more. So I can't name all of them, even in our own solar system. Um, some enterprising young student could do that. There's only, there's only like 200. You could do it. But um, I'm not going to name all the moons. And all the stars, we think there's 100 billion stars in our galaxy. And so the, some of the brighter ones have proper names like Vega and Altair and things like that. Um, then they start using uh, a Greek letter and the name of the constellation. So like Alpha Centauri, okay? So Centaurus is the constellation. Alpha, that would be the brightest star in that constellation and so on. And then after that, they go to numbers. And then after a while, they just start using the coordinates of the star because we don't have enough words to name all the stars in our galaxy, let alone all the other galaxies. All right. Uh, what resources or tools or training would you recommend for teaching high schoolers logic and the right view of how false evolution is? So, yeah, so um, the, the book Introduction to Logic is explicitly written for that, Introduction to Logic. And then if you, ex if you specifically want to apply it to evolution, then that little book, Discerning Truth, that goes through the top ten fallacies that evolutionists tend to commit. So those would be the two, Introduction to Logic and Discerning Truth. All right. What is the likelihood of most, the most distant Saturn and Jupiter moons jumping orbits? Well, um, in terms of um, swapping, like swapping orbits, they wouldn't do that. There's two moons of Saturn that swap orbits because of their close proximity, but the outer moons are not going to do that. If, you, if they mean um, getting their orbit altered, that can happen. If a comet goes through the system or... or moons can be captured. Asteroids can be captured and become moons. That, that's a, there's a known process that will do that. And maybe some of the outer moons were once not moons that were separate asteroids that have been captured gravitationally. There are three-body interactions that will do that. So, and the farther away they are from their planet, the more likely that is to happen. So that could happen. Is it possible for Venus to, uh, to be involved in an eclipse where we see Venus in front of the sun? Yes, it's called a transit. Um, the eclipse is reserved when the objects are about the same size, so the apparent size. So the moon is 400 times smaller than the sun, but also 400 times closer, so it appears about the same size in the sky. Venus appears tiny, and it, it, does, it does cross in front of the sun. It does that twice every hundred and some years, and the two events are always separated by eight years. So that last happened in 2004 and 2012, so you just missed it, and you probably won't live to see the next one. But it does happen. I got to see the one in 2012. And, I, and, and in fact, I think my book, Stargazer's Guide, has a picture of it. It's this little black dot crossing in front of the sun. It's, it's neat to see. But yeah, you won't see the next one. You might see Mercury cross, because Mercury does it um, once every few decades. I think the next, I've seen several Mercury transits. And the next one's like, I think, 2053 or something like that. So that one you might make. Optimistic. Do we know how many days were in between Adam and Eve being created to when they sinned? We don't know the number of days. Uh, most theologians believe it was a relatively short period of time because they were told to go and multiply, and being in their perfect condition, they would have done that efficiently, and yet, apparently, they sinned before their first child. So the assumption is it was within Eve's first menstrual, menstrual cycle, so within a month. All right. As God, as God created Adam as a man and not a boy or baby, can we use this as a comparative example of the strate, uh, strategy of our universe from what we can observe or reason? Well, yeah, the universe was made functional from the beginning. It didn't have to go through a developmental stage from childhood to adult and so on. And now secularists believe that it did, but um, they don't have any evidence for that. In fact, the uh, James Webb Space Telescope recently revealed that they were expecting these baby galaxies at great distances. They didn't find them. They found adult galaxies at great distances, which is something I predicted, actually. So if you want to make correct predictions, start with biblical creation. So, yeah, that was 2020, just last year, 2022. Um, there were three predictions that I'd made that James Webb would detect that were the opposite of what the secularists were predicting. And my predictions were right because I based my thinking on God's word. So... Um, I predicted that these galaxies would be, that there would be galaxies at greater distances than they were expecting, much greater, and that's been confirmed. That the galaxies would be mature, fully designed galaxies, which is confirmed, and that they would have the presence of heavy elements in them, because baby galaxies shouldn't, but adult galaxies would. So, yeah, those were, those were confirmed last year. Last year was a fun year. 
<laughs> All right. How many stars are in existence that we know of? So there are at least 100 billion stars in our galaxy, and there's at least 100 billion galaxies, and probably more with James Webb now finding them out at greater distances. So there's a lot of stars. So 100 billion. Times, times 100 billion. Times probably 100 times billion. 10 or 100. Can you do that on your calculator real quick, Jeff? <laughs> so it'd be one to the power of um, about 20 or so, something like that. So one to the 18 would be, that would be a billion. Um, so 100 billion, 11, so around 10 to the power of 22 stars, somewhere around there. Okay, with that said, are or can stars still be created? Um, there's, there's no um, theological problem with that, but I don't think they do. I don't think, a star is not like a living organism where it requires a lot of design. It's a ball of gas. That being said, the conditions in space for gas to f fall in and collapse on itself, I think that probably doesn't happen. There's a limit, it's called the gene's mass. It's just a question of whether or not it occurs. Um, gas tends to spread out in space. Now once a star is made, it's, it's small enough that its gravity will hold it together because gravity diminishes as the square of the distance. So uh, in a nebula, the, the outward force of gas pressure would normally be orders of magnitude larger than the meager inward pull of gravity. So once you make a star, it will stay a star. But getting a star to form naturally, I don't think it happens. So I don't think they form today. And, and we, by the way, we've never seen it happen. You'll see you know, claims, well, this is a star-forming region. Let me clue you in. What they find there are bright, hot blue stars that everyone agrees can't last millions and millions of years. And so they must, they've assumed they must have formed recently, and therefore it's a star-forming region. It's really evidence of the young universe. Joshua commanded the sun to stand still. If the sun is fixed and the earth revolves around it, and can you explain the science of why he did not command the earth to stand still? Yeah, it's because we use the earth as a reference frame, and so does the Bible. Uh, so hence, you know, in my Stargazer's Guide to the Night Sky, I talk about sunrise and sunset. Now, I hope some future author doesn't say, well, he didn't think the earth rotates. He thinks the earth goes around the sun. No, it's, it's convenient to use the earth as a reference frame because we all live there. And, so, and in fact, in jo even in Joshua, in one of the passages, he gives the reference frame. He says, the sun and the moon in the midst of the sky. So he's, he's giving the reference frame as the Earth's sky. And that's a legitimate reference frame. You can do that. Why is Pluto not a planet any longer? There it is. So, um, yeah. So it got, uh, it got demoted. And the reason had to do with the discovery. Well, first of all, when they first discovered Pluto, they thought it might be as big as the Earth. And then they did more. It's, it's, hard, it's so far out. You can't see any size to it in an Earth a ground-based telescope, you can't. Even Hubble barely sees any size to Pluto. And so um, then they redid the estimate and they figured, well, maybe it's as big as Mars, half the size of the Earth. Then they discovered, oh, that's not even that big. It's smaller than Mars even, it's perhaps smaller than Mercury, which it is. And then they discovered, oh, it's got a moon. And so part of that light, a moon that's half its size. And so some of that light that they thought was coming from the planet was coming from the moon, which means it's actually even smaller. And we now know that Pluto is two-thirds the size of Earth's moon. It's not big. So that was part of it. And then the other part was we started finding a bunch of other objects out at the same distance as Pluto. Those are called trans-Neptunian objects, TNOs. And they're out at that distance. And some of them are almost as big as Pluto. And the, the real um, twist came when they discovered one that at the time they thought was bigger. When they found Eris, um, they, they thought, initially they thought it was a little bigger than Pluto. And so, should we call that the 10th planet? And if, by the way, if that's the 10th planet, should we add in these other 10 or so that are almost as big as Pluto? Should we have 30 or more planets in our solar system? Now think of the children that are gonna have to memorize this stuff, right? <laughs> so it was just easier, Pluto being so much smaller than, than the other, the classical eight planets, it was easier to kick that out and just call it the largest member of this new class of object, uh, trans-Neptunian objects. So that's what happened. And by the way, it wasn't the first time that happened when the first asteroids were discovered. The first four asteroids were originally planets. There was a time when our solar system had 11 planets. And the ones you haven't heard of, uh, Ceres, uh, Vesta, Pallas, and Juno, those were discovered, Ceres was discovered in 1801. And then within the next few years, all, those four were there and our solar system had 11 planets because Neptune hadn't been discovered yet. And then in the mid 18, 40s, 1850s, they started finding another dozen or so of these asteroids, and they said, maybe we ought to reclassify these as a new type of object, because asteroids are very small as well. 
So it's not the first time that happened. Do stars have mass? Like, or can you stand on them? They I have, guess versus gaseous. Well, they are. They have mass. They don't have solidity. They're not solid. You can't stand on one um, because they're fluid, right? So, but they do have mass, it, and it's the it's the mass of the sun that causes the Earth to stay in orbit, as opposed to just continue to go in one direction in space. So, yeah, they do have mass. Everything everything that has substance, everything that has Everything that has substance has mass, basically. Yeah. All right. What is the difference between a gaseous star and a gaseous planet? A star is large enough that it can initiate hydrogen fusion in the core, and planets can't. So Jupiter doesn't have any fusion going on in its core. It has insufficient temperature and pressure to fuse hydrogen into helium. But the sun can, because its core is much, it's got a lot more material. It's bigger, it's more massive. So mass would be the difference. Um, anything heavier than... Uh, a certain number, I forget what the number is, a certain number of Jupiter masses uh, will initiate hydrogen fusion. There's an intermediate class too where you can, you can fuse heavy hydrogen, deuterium. Those are called brown dwarfs. Those are kind of intermediate between a planet and a star. How can a Christian rightly know whether someone is speaking of quantum physics when they refer to quantum physics? We've noticed quantum physics refer to... For, or, or referred to for ju the justification of new age and false doctrines? Hmm. So, well, um, you'd have to study it. I mean, you'd have to study quantum physics to know if somebody's speaking rightly about it or, <clears throat> or wrongly about it. If what they're saying is contrary to what the Bible teaches, then it's wrong, right? So that <clears throat> that's one indicator. Uh, some people ha have tried to justify absurdities with quantum, uh, especially the Copenhagen interpretation, where you have particles that are sort of there and not there at the same time in the same sense. And doesn't that violate the law of non-contradiction? Well, the actual physics doesn't. There are certain interpretations that do. But the fact is, particles behave like waves <clears throat> until you do an experiment that forces them to be in a specific position. Otherwise, they act like they're spread out over space and expanding. And, um, but they never act like a wave and not a wave at the same time. They never act like a particle and not a particle at the same time. So they don't violate the law of non-contradiction. So that's one, of, that's one of the claims that I've heard is that um, well, logical, laws of logic don't work in the quantum realm. You could never have discovered that if laws of logic didn't work in the quantum realm. Right? Because you're using logic to reason about quantum. So no, they, they, they can't be used to disprove any principle of logic or of scripture for that matter. You just have to do your homework and see if what, they're, what the person's saying lines up with what we do know about quantum physics. I do have a couple of articles on the website on, on quantum physics if you kind of want to dip your toe in the pool a little bit. What about the multiverse? Is there any rationale for the multiverse? Uh, no. As far as we know, God's created the one universe, and if he, if he made others, he hasn't told us, and therefore there's no rational reason to believe in them, right? Because uh, if, we need to, if we're going to believe in something, we ought to have a rational reason for it. And by definition, we couldn't possibly know about any other universe because it doesn't interact with ours unless God told us, which he hasn't. So it's not there. The, the secular reason, the reason why many secularists believe in a multiverse is because um, if you believe this universe came about by chance, it's just so improbable that it came about in such a delightful way as to allow for life forms like us. It's remarkable. It's almost as if it's designed. And you can't, if you can't handle that it's designed, then you commit the gambler's fallacy and you say, well, we must live in the lucky universe where the, all the other ones, uh, life wasn't designed. And that is, a, that is a fallacy. But it's one that scientists make. Did global warming kill the last of the dinosaurs and are we next? Uh, dum, dum, dum. So, no, up. because uh, the evidence would seem to indicate that dinosaurs lived, uh, some of them, into the you know a few hundred years ago perhaps uh, some of the some of the legends that I that I read you are from a few hundred years ago, and yet there was a time when the Earth was considerably warmer than it is now. There was the medieval warming period around 1000 A.D., and we know that the Earth's temperature was higher then because the way people you could there, you could grow uh, certain fruits at higher latitudes back then because the Earth was a little warmer than it is today. So we we've, we've done this before. We the Earth has experienced warmer temperatures than it does today. It's just people didn't freak out, at, freak out about it back then um, because they had more sense than people have today. So, yeah. So dinosaurs, apparently some of them lived through that period. It didn't kill them off. All right. Let's see. You wrote several articles on your website about flat earth. Can you speak on that for a moment? 
Yeah, the Bible teaches the world's round in Isaiah. We're not, I guess the best passage would be Job 26.10, where it says that God um, inscribes a circle on the waters at the boundary between light and darkness. That boundary is, we, we astronomers call that the terminator. That's where light stops or terminates. It's where evening and morning occur. And the only way you can get a circular terminator is on a sphere. There's no other shape that will always produce a circular terminator. So the Bible mentions the roundness of the earth, and that's in Job, which was 2000 B.C. As far as I can tell, the earliest reference to a round earth is in Job. The, the secularists believed the earth was flat at that point, and it wasn't until around 500 B.C. or so, 500, yeah, around 500 B.C., that uh, folks like Pythagoras started proposing that the earth was round. Aristotle is considered the first to prove that the world's round. It's very easy to demonstrate that the earth is round. Um, in fact, I have some articles on the website that show you some experiments you can do to detect the uh, spherical nature of the Earth. Um, I live in Colorado Springs where it's very easy to detect the roundness of the Earth because you can see it from the top of Pikes Peak. You can see the curvature, it's pretty neat. But um, you can also, even when I, was, when I was young even, we took our first, I grew up in Ohio, we took our first family vacation out to Colorado, to Colorado Springs, that's when I fell in love with the state. And I was 16 and I thought, you know, I could, how, how long till we see the mountains? And I did a little calculation and based on the size of the earth, I calculated how long we should be, you know, how far away we should be able to see Pikes Peak. It turns out it's around 150 miles given the size of the earth. And that's just a simple trigonometry problem. So, you, and you can do it in reverse. You can say how far, you know, how far out should we be able to see from Pikes Peak? And it turns out it's about 150 miles. If the earth were flat, you could see it Theoretically, at any distance, right, with a powerful enough telescope, everything, you ought to be able to see every mountain from every other mountain, but you can't. And so uh, it, here's an experiment you can do. You can go to Dodge City and look west, and if you see Pikes Peak, the Earth's flat. If you can't see it, the Earth's round. So there you go. Did anyone else do trigonometry on their vacation on the way to Colorado when they were a kid? Okay, I'm not the only one that did not. All right. How can you demonstrate that the Christian God exists, uh, creator of the universe, can suspend the laws of gravity? In other words, how should an apologist justify divine hiddenness, uh, e.g. lack of confirmed miracles? Well, okay, so it's not the lack, it's, it's not miracles that should convince you that God exists. It's the orderliness that we find in nature that should convince you that God exists because there's no basis for it apart from the Christian worldview. It's the Christian God who has imposed patterns on nature and that's why we can make predictions like the eclipse that uh, was predicted for today. We can do that because God promised us that the future will be like the past in terms of basic cycles, the day and night cycle and so on. And as David Hume pointed out from his secular point of view, there is no rational basis for believing that. And so anytime you trust in the predictions of the astronomers and, and things like that, you're assuming induction, which only is justifiable with the Christian God. So that's one, that's one answer right there. Uh, we saw this morning how logic and the, the laws of logic, their existence and their properties, we can only know about them if God exists, is who he claims to be in Scripture and has revealed himself to us. Otherwise, you'd have no justification for believing in those things. And it won't do to say, well, they've worked in the past because then you're assuming induction and so on, things that you can't assume apart from the Christian worldview. So that's one way. It's very easy to demonstrate God's existence. You don't need miracles. Now, can God do miracles? Yes. Uh, God can temporarily suspend the order that he's placed in creation to do something extraordinary, but he doesn't do that on a whim. Miracles, by definition, are rare. And so, and we don't really need them in order to justify the existence of the Christian God. It's, it's, the, regu it's the regularity in nature, not its absence, that demonstrates the biblical God. Okay, which makes more uh, sense, more probable? A, the supernatural accounts as claimed by the Bible are true, including the existence of a supreme being who is undetectable and undemonstrable, maybe. Okay, sorry, it kind of blurs together and my vision is not good. Uh, or B, the Old Testament is an amalgamation of imagined stories to explain an origin of ignorant and illiterate people, except for church leaders. That continues, and the New Testament is a collection of letters from a person with a supposed supernatural experience and supposed eyewitness accounts of an effective magician. Well, uh, a lot there. You got yeah, it. yeah. Um, neither. That's that's a bifurcation fallacy, because the first is asking about a God who's hidden, who's undetectable. The, the biblical God's very detectable by what He does. He's invisible, so you know. Well, can I see Him? Well, no, you can't because He's a spirit. He fills the universe. If you could see Him, you couldn't see anything else because He's everywhere. So um, fortunately, He's a spirit. But he's very detectable, and one of the ways you detect him is he makes knowledge possible. 
right? Because we can reason logically and so on. I don't, and we, we demonstrated that that only makes sense in the Christian worldview, at least briefly. I didn't cover all the loopholes, but you can do that on your own. Induction only makes sense in light of the biblical God. Uh, could the Old Testament be stories that are made up? No, because archaeology has confirmed many of them. So even secular archaeologists, when they want to know where to dig, they go to the Bible to find out where to look because they know that it records true history. And if it didn't, we couldn't justify things like induction and so on. So um, the Bible's the only thing rationally that makes sense. It's not, it's not rational to disbelieve the Bible and to, and to try to say, well, no, it's just made up stories because that wouldn't account for anything. How would you account for the fact that they knew the world was round at the time of Job? That's amazing. Or that they knew the height of the stars and things. I mean, there are other little, little tidbits of information that are in Scripture that, you know, like the expansion of the universe, which is mentioned in um, Isaiah 40, 22, that God stretches out the heavens like a curtain. That wasn't discovered by scientific means until the 1920s. And, and frankly, you need modern instruments to discover it by scientific means. You need telescopes and spectroscopes. And they didn't have those. Telescope wasn't invented until 1610 or 16, 1608. So, yeah, I mean, so yeah, it can't be a collection of stories as much as people would like to believe that so they can live the way they want to live. It is utterly irrational to believe that. It is, it is only reasonable uh, to believe that the Bible is what it claims to be. And then that makes knowledge possible in science and induction and logic and things like that. As the public school systems are teaching and have been for many years the Big Bang and evolution, how does this uh, contradict Christian worldview and how has it affected our culture today? To the last question, negatively, um, so people think that they're getting neutral education in public schools. You're not. You're being taught to ignore God in every subject. And the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So every class ought to start with God. If you, want to, if you want to see how the different subjects relate together, you need to start with God and the way he thinks about things. And then you, then you see, then stuff makes sense. You can explain why math applies to the physical world because math reflects God's thinking. The real world is upheld by the mind of God. So, of course, the real world will obey math, which it does. Secularists can't make sense of that. The, the brilliant Nobel Prize winning physicist Eugene Wigner wrote a wonderful article on that where he was, he's called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences where he pointed out that from his apparently non-Christian worldview he couldn't make sense of why the universe obeys math. So you see students aren't taught that and so they don't know how to think properly about many things and it causes all kinds of problems. Uh, the Big Bang and evolution, they're, they're not good science, they're, they're, not good, they're not supported well scientifically. And they do contradict what the Bible teaches about origins. And so naturally, the Christian doctrines that are rooted in creation, things like marriage, right? We get that because God made the male and female. And yeah, that, that goes back to Genesis. And so what are we seeing now? Marriage is under attack. It's, it's, it's right. We're seeing all kinds of sexual perversion in our culture today. And that makes sense because if we're just evolved animals, why not do what you want? And so the erosion of Christian morality necessarily follows from the, the erosion of the Christian foundation in the minds of people. Do solar eclipses only happen on days with a new moon? I researched this and found today and April 8th to be days with new moons. Yes, yes they do. They only happen on a new moon because that's when the moon is between, sort of the between the earth and the sun and only when it's exactly between the earth and the sun where you get, where it's shadow. Normally it will pass a little above or a little below the plane, but when it passes directly in front of it, you get an eclipse. But yeah, that only happens on a new moon. And then the lunar eclipses only happen on a full moon. Any further development on your theory on starlight and distant time? Any new insights? Well, I used it to make the predictions of what the James Webb Space Telescope would detect um, last year. I, I made those predictions back in January, and then they were confirmed in July, and I wrote a follow-up article in September basically saying, hey, you know, the secular predictions were wrong, but we creationists, we made correct predictions because we're apparently on the right track in terms of our cosmology. So I think that's a confirmation of the model. It doesn't prove it, but it's certainly consistent with it. Can you explain a little bit more of it to us? The, the, um, yeah, so the, the model that I have on distant starlight involves the one-way speed of light, which it turns out is immeasurable. Einstein, uh, this is well known in, to physicists, but it's not well known else, elsewhere. Uh, uh, Einstein realized that the speed of light in any one direction cannot be measured, but is instead stipulated. Yeah, whereas the round trip speed can be measured. In other words, you send light, bounce it off a mirror, bring it back, measure the time, you'll get the same answer every time if the distance is the same. Okay? But uh, we don't know that it goes the same speed out as it comes back, and that's because it turns out that's not a property of the universe at all. It's, it has to do with how we choose to define what now means at a distance. And Einstein found that there was more than one way to do it, and it's kind of complicated. Okay? But that's... 
that's the, the short answer, is that we can see light from distant galaxies immediately. It doesn't take millions of years. Depending on how we define now in space, which Einstein says is flexible, and that's kind of interesting. It's, it, the physics of Einstein allows light to travel from distant galaxies to Earth immediately, although the return trip would take time. And it has to do with the way now is defined in space. It's not easy to, to explain it in an elevator talk, to be honest with you. I'm still working on that. I understood it fully. I don't know about you guys, but I'm right there with Jason. Okay, so it doesn't discount a, uh, the creation story, light years. No, it doesn't. It's, it's, pro it's fully, con that's, that's, the, that's the great joy of it, is the physics of Einstein doesn't require the universe to be old at all, any, any older than the biblical age of thousands of years, and yet we can still see distant galaxies. So, my book, The Physics of Einstein, goes into detail on that, and I've got some articles on the website as well, if you want to kind of get the backstory. It's something that's hard to explain in, you know, like I said, in a minute or so. It just, it takes a little bit of background. Okay. All right. Any other questions you guys have that you'd like to ask at this point? Anyone? All right. His question yeah. for those watching is, is there any evidence of stars dying? Yes, so stars, there's no evidence of stars forming, but we do see evidence. Stars occasionally blow themselves to bits in what we call a supernova. I've seen several of them. They're cool. <laughs> Star just complete. It only happens with the really massive stars, but they will blow themselves to bits, and they briefly become as bright as the rest of their galaxy. So we haven't had one in our own galaxy for a while, and we're overdue, because they normally happen in our galaxy roughly once a century, and it's been about four centuries, so I can't wait for the next one. But I've seen, I've seen some in other galaxies where the star blows up and briefly becomes as bright as that galaxy. It's spectacular to see. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, do, do I deal with light in transit? Uh, yes, I do, and um, that's the position that God created the beams of light on their way, which he certainly has the power to do. I just don't think he did it that way, and I give the reasons on, on, on those articles. Um, and mine, I, I'm calling it the ASC, A-S-C, which stands for Anisotropic Synchrony Convention. Ask. Ask and you shall receive. That's good. That's good. I thought that was it. <laughs> Any other questions you guys have? Yes, sir. Um, I wouldn't go smaller than six inches. In, that's the diameter of the mirror or lens. Um, if it's a refractor, you might get away with five inches. But if you go smaller than that, enjoy the moon. Um, but with six inches, you can see planets, you can see moons, you can see some of the details on Jupiter. You can probably see the red spot. It's shrinking, so it's a little harder to see now than it was in the 80s. But um, globular clusters, once you get... If you get up to eight inches, you can clearly see individual stars in globular clusters, and that is, those are gorgeous. So that's with an eight-inch telescope. Bigger's better. Every time I get out my tel, every time, so I when I take my telescope out, because I live in a light polluted area, I have to take it out someplace remote, and I pack it in my car. And when I'm disassembling it and packing that huge behemoth in my car, I'm thinking, why did I go so big? But then when I'm looking through it, I'm like, why didn't I go bigger? Because the, the bigger it is, the brighter things there are, and you get better resolution. All right. Other questions? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so, yeah, what was the mechanism, basically, that God used to apparently stopped the sun and moon in the sky. I think he just stopped the earth. He just said, let the angular momentum of the earth be zero for a short period of time. And then it was about a day, actually, uh, um, in the Joshua account, and then apparently started it up again. So I think, but he might have stopped the entire solar system. But we don't know, because the moon moves so slowly relative to the earth that it could, it would appear, you wouldn't notice its motion. So um, he might have just stopped the entire solar system and allowed human activity to continue. But uh, that, that, that appears to be an example of where God did suspend temporarily the laws of nature as we know them. There's no natural mechanism that would do that. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. 
Okay, was there an event that caused me to, yeah. Um, not, one, not any one event, but I, I just always have found this stuff fascinating. I've always really enjoyed science, and I've loved the Lord since I was a little kid, and he saved me from my sins. And so I, I naturally want to, you know, I want to please him. I want to glorify him as much as I can. But certainly as I've shared this information with others and I've seen them get enthused, that, that certainly uh, feeds my interest in it. I love blessing people and, and, and seeing them get encouraged that, yeah, the Bible really is true. It really is the Word of God. And you can trust it. So that's exciting for me. But it wasn't any one event. It's just that's been my experience over time. Okay, when, when did I know I wanted to be an astrophysicist and what did my parents do uh, to foster that? I, I was very young. When I, well, I knew I wanted to go into science when I was a little kid. Far back as I can remember, I loved science, and astronomy in particular. But I'll be honest with you, I like all the sciences. I really do. I could sit down and listen to, to a biologist talk about his area of expertise. or, or it, 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 They're all just fascinating to me. I like to know how things work and... and uh, and, and my parents encouraged me with that. They, they, they knew that I had an interest in that and perhaps, perhaps a gift in being able to understand these things and maybe explain them. And so they uh, encouraged me to pursue that. I have, I have very great parents. They're uh, alive and well and they're serving the Lord as well. So that was, that was a real blessing for me. All right. Any other questions? Right there. Go ahead. Where did I get my start in astronomy? Uh, when I was a little kid, and we would go to the library, that's what we, ha that's what we had before Google. <laughs> and when I'd go to the kids' section, I'd, I'd just go straight to the astronomy books, and I always liked that. So um, that helped. And um, Star Wars came out when I was a kid. That helped, yeah. And uh, that, that, in that um, boosted my in um, interest in music as well, because the music in that is just beautiful, just wonderful. And... Um, and then my, my dad and my grandpa, my dad and his dad, they had an interest in astronomy, too. And so my grandpa had a small telescope. My dad had an identical telescope that I commandeered and began using when I was very young, with his permission, of course. And so I, I'd just go out at night and look at stuff. It was just, it's, just, it's something that was just always, always in me, I think. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, so the question basically is how do we go faster in space? Yeah, you'd need a more efficient uh, propulsion mechanism. Um, I don't know what that would be. Uh, there, but in any case, there's a speed limit to the universe. It's the speed of light. And so that really limits our exploration of anything beyond the solar system. The solar system is within our, our reach. We can, kinda, we can go to these different worlds. Um, I've always thought it was a neat idea. It's been toyed with of sending a probe to another star system. And to do that, the, the, the energy you have to get it to is just enormous. And so they talked about, well, could we scale it down to the size of a cell phone to where we could send this little craft out at, you know, maybe 20% the speed of light. So, we don't, you know, and at that point, it would only take 20 years to get to the nearest star. I mean, it's still, it's just the distances are incredible. So I think the future of astronomy is in uh, remote observation observing things here from Earth using bigger and bigger telescopes. So I think the, the James Webb type philosophy, I think that's the future of astronomy, other than solar system exploration, uh, because that's accessible. We've now visited, we've sent probes to the limit of the solar system now, so we can do that. But the next star, just to put it in perspective, if you put um, the orbit of Neptune in a, in a box that's six, what would it be, six trillion, no, six billion miles on a side, six billion miles on a side, then how many boxes to the next star? 2,478. So it's just astonishing. The distance between the stars is just amazing. So we're not gonna, we're not gonna visit other star systems in the foreseeable future, but we are getting much better at seeing them from here with, with better and better telescopes. So I think that's the future of astronomy. Yeah. All right. Yes, sir. Are there places where light 
has never been. Okay, I was going to say University of Colorado, but um, <laughs> sorry. It's a good school. It's just there's not a lot of light there. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's probably the, like the core of a planet, something like that, you know, that, that would be blocking out. Yeah, I'm sure there are places where it's dark all the time. Yeah. In distant space, even in distant space, you still get some starlight. But I'm thinking like the core of Jupiter or something like that, where there really wouldn't be any light at all. Yeah. Uh, are black holes still theoretical? I would say no. I think we've, we've imaged them. And you say, well, how do we image something that's black? Because we've seen the accretion disk around it. And we've done that with, um, with two black holes now. There's, there's a black hole. We think there's a black hole in the center of every galaxy. And um, M87 was the first one that they were able to image using radio telescopes, using a combination of radio telescopes. There is a technique in physics where you can use radio telescopes and combine them such that they act like one big one, like one big radio telescope the size of the Earth. And that allows you to get very fine resolution. And so we've been able to image the galaxy at the core of M87. And it has an accretion disk around it, just like we were expecting. And apparently, we've been able to image the one in our own galaxy as well. And it also has that accretion disk. So uh, and in any case, we've known for a long time. We've seen stars that orbit invisible companions. Cygnus X1, there's this, there's this X-ray source. But if you look at it in a small telescope, there's this little blue star there. And every six days, it orbits an invisible companion. So I think the I think they're as confirmed as, as possible without falling into one. And what are they? How would you define them? A black hole is a region of space where the gravity is so intense that nothing, not even light, can escape. And light being the fastest substance, nothing can escape once it reaches a certain distance from the, the center. So what, it's, it is taking things into it? If anything comes sufficiently close, if it, if it passes into what's called the event horizon, which is the point of no return, it will have to get crushed and add to the mass of the black hole. So it grows a little bit. So the, the, all the mass in the black hole is in the center, at a point called the singularity. And there's a region around it, which is the hole, um, where w there's a point of no return. There's a certain distance uh, called the, um, the short shield radius. And, and anything beyond that distance, you can escape. But if you're within that distance, you're going to die. So you, you don't want to get within that distance. Keep that in mind, guys. Don't get too close. All right. Any other questions? Last one. I've got a couple. Okay, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. The, yeah. The, yeah. So the question is, can a black hole swallow a black hole? Yeah. They can. They can coalesce. Yeah. It'd be like you could imagine two uh, drops of water and then just and make a bigger one. Black holes will do that. Yeah. We think we've detected some of those actually by their gravitation because they they emit gravitational waves when they do that, and we have detectors on Earth that can detect those, and we think we found some now. Yeah, so that does happen. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, one of them um, is I'm predicting that, let's see, because I, I think I wrote it, I think I included it in the article, is I'm expecting to find planets that are contrary to the secular prediction of how planets should form. For example, I'm expecting James Webb will confirm. We, we suspect there are certain planets that orbit their star perpendicular to the star's rotation. So the star's rotating this way, the planet's orbiting like that, or some, in some cases even backwards. And I think there's good evidence for that. I'm expecting <clears throat> that James Webb will confirm that. Pardon me. I'll wrap up just to the drive. Anyway, <clears throat> so that's one prediction that I'm making. And then I'm expecting to detect the presence of powerful magnetic fields in some of these planets. Uh, magnetic fields decay with time, so they can't be billions of years old. But if we find them, that would be an indication of youth. We found that in our own solar system. I'm expecting to see that in other solar systems as well. So those are some things to look forward to, hopefully. Last question. Would you like to say anything about UFOs that are so popular these days? So the, the more you study the night sky, the more UFOs become IFOs, identified flying objects, right? So um, most objects, if not all, that other people claim are UFOs, when I look at it, I know what it is. I'm just, I'm just saying, OK? And so I remember I was with a friend one time. What is that? We saw a series. I'm like, oh, that's um, Elon Musk's. That's a Starlink project. If you've ever seen a Starlink launch, it's impressive. You see this string of satellites. It's gorgeous. If you didn't know what it was, you're like, are we being invaded? I mean, because it's like, you know, are, are a bunch of battleships surrounding us. So, um, so that's one thing. There are lots of things that people mistake that to them are UFOs, right? And, and there's nothing, we, we, um, that term has become a little bit misaligned with, you know, well, it's an alien 
being. No, it just means it's an object that is flying that to you is unidentified. And so, do the UFOs exist? Yeah, if you don't know what they are, yeah. But, um, but most of them have a very logical and ordinary and mundane explanation, like satellites and the International Space Station. And there were the lights that, that you see, well, somewhere in Texas, where they, under certain conditions, when you get an inversion layer, you can see distant cars farther than you normally would be able to because of the way the light bends. And people were reporting those as UFOs, but only on days when there was heavy traffic, interestingly. And so a lot of those things, um, we, we pretty much know what they are. All right. Uh, Dr. Lai will be speaking tomorrow morning here at 10 a.m. You guys feel free to join us uh, for that. Uh, he'll be here for a few more moments if you want to talk to him for a moment. And also uh, make sure you visit the book table out there and buy every single book and support his ministry. All right, let's end in prayer. Dear Holy Father, we thank you that you have made everything as you have made it to where the heavens declare your glory and night to night and day to day just pours out speech about you. Uh, help us not to look around and see all that you have created and try to deny that you have. Uh, it is, is un, ir illogical and unreasonable to do such a thing. Help us instead to look at, to the skies, to look to the sun, to look to the moon, to look at the earth, to look at one another and see how amazing you are, that uh, we, we see that you are eternal. You have spoken and created all things, and your power is on display for us to see every day. Help us to take that in and uh, to use this conference to appreciate that even more. We pray to continue to bless Jason and his ministry and uh, continue to him as he proclaims the truth around the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming. And our next conference will be Martha Peace, a ladies' conference in November. All right. Dismiss.